every believer should at least know three keys or lords of answered prayers. You should know at least three. So that the frustration, I pray, nothing is happening, can stop. You hear people say such things. They think it's God that is not. No. There are conditions that are not being met. You should know at least three. I use a combination of seven. I don't want to bother you with that now. You should know at least three. You know, like for example, when you get to a door that has multiple locks. For example, you turn the key this way, you turn it this way, you turn it this way, you have locked the door. You see, you did it three times. When you also come to unlock it, you don't do once and open. It will open. You need to also do it one, two, three. Then it will open. The way you get to the ones that have multiple locks, they have a key, they have a bolt, they have another one, maybe with number. Then you unlock the one with key with key. You unlock the one with bolt by unbolting. Then the one with number, you put in that code and then you open the door. That's how the things of God works. Ecclesiastes cast your bread upon the waters you will find. he's talking about sowing and reaping anyway and when you sow after some time will pass so you have sowing you have harvest here then you have time in between okay you will find it after some days in verse 2 give a portion to seven and also to eight for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth now this is issue in investment you guys call it uh, creating multiple streams of income because you don't want when something happens to you are depending only on that job and something happens your company is downsizing your whole family is thrown into chaos a man that wants to live in abundance does not only function only from one source of income Maybe this is a good opportunity for me to say this. So even those of you who are priests can take note. Like your pastors, your priests. You need to have investments. You need to have. Um, you're doing well. Already. You need to have. As a pastor, you can own a school. As a pastor, you can own a business. As a pastor, you can own an estate. Some people think pastors, just because he's a man of God. You know, <laughs> ah, Lord. You can own a transport company. You can own a hospital. You can do it in such a way that your wife is one focusing on this area. And you on this area. Do you see what the scriptures say? So, create multiple streams. So, because Jesus said, some of your harvest will yield 30 fold, some 60 fold, some 100 fold. Since we don't control what the ground will do. So, he said the solution is, don't just sow one seed and said, 2029, I sowed in January. So, God, 2021, is that a way? I sold one seed in January, or I sold this into a building project, or I sold this. No, people like us are rich in good works. And if you are an investor, don't just care. I say, I put all my money in any bank. I invested in their stock. Because you don't know what evil might be upon the earth. You don't know whether it is that one that could be shaken by one government policy or one economic shakings in the economic system. So, give a portion to seven and to eight. Make sure that every year you have at least seven types of seeds you have sown. You sowed in charity projects. You sowed in this. You sowed in the building project. You sowed in this. You are covered. This, I'm telling you how I operate. Because I know the laws. When you don't know the conditions, you are not covered. You operate out of emotion. 
is hard after I made breakthrough in understanding. It is hard, no matter the circumstances that are prevalent, prevalent on the earth. If you like, tell me there is global meltdown or what. It is very hard to find me trapped. If this one is hit by that, this tree would take me up. You know, one of the things I've noticed about ministry, like Nigerian pastors particularly, they don't tell people truth. Me, I'm not afraid to talk about me, including mistakes. I'm not afraid of it. I have found that it does not remove nothing from you. But what it does is that it gives people, because sometimes people look at people that have God has lifted, they think they started from top. No, it gives, it puts the steps that got people there. I believe that we should tell the story behind the glory and not leave people hanging. Leave people hanging. Ah, we have I've never quarreled with my wife. Stop lying. Since we started this meeting, we have never been broke. Stop lying. Tell people how you bro broke through the season. There were such seasons. That man that is still talking like that had you cannot have two people in a home and say they have never quarreled. Tell people how you did it and how you learned to conquer that. And then people who are there will find their way. You talk like you are God. You exist in heaven. That's nonsense. You don't fool people like us with such things. We live in a world that is broken. We live in a world that is falling. We live in a world that is messed up. There are problems here. But there are solutions. Give a portion to seven. So I will tell you, I'm, I'm using what I have learned and what has changed. Me. For example, in the parable of the sower, Jesus said, The sower, the good man went to sow, and it's Jesus that was the sower. And now he left the space and made you and I the sower. The sower sows the word. So when it comes to preaching of the word, ministers of the gospel, he said, The sower finished one of the soil didn't do well because it was wayside he is describing the lives of the people that heard the message why the message is not producing result in their lives and out of the four types of soil he described it was one that was a good soil and that one produced harvest so when I come and preach and teach on any subject there are, it is one out of four. Do you see? One out of four that will produce the harvest. Pastor Ben. 25% of the hearers produce the harvest. Because the harvest come to those who are doers. Not to those who are hearers. Some people hear and stop with hearing. They are happy with the revelation. But when they go, that's where they end. But there are these people that leave and they go, they go and put it to practice in their life. They come back with results. So he picked the three other soils that did not bear fruit and explained what hindered them. So, that was wonderful. Then as a man of God, and God uses you to touch lives around the world, it is one out of the four people you touch that will come back and say thank you. Because this is, the Bible said the laborer is worthy of his wages. Some people don't know that it's work that we are doing. They think we are just they know that they should pay the doctors, their doctors. They know that they should pay their landlords. They know they should pay their children's teachers. But they think their pastors and spiritual leaders are the ones who are there to, to be crucified on the cross. And this is why some of them, 
if a pastor wears good clothes, I'm not talking about here because we've trained our people. If you have such issue here, you need to grow up. We, don't, we, don't, we are not on that level at all. But you see such issues. I mean, a pastor has a car. Somebody's angry. He's driving a good car. So he's supposed to be driving, push me and push you, you know. Some people get angry. If they see a minister, they forget that. The same way you need to pay your children's school fees, that the pastor also pays school fees. The same way you need to parent, that's how he has to parent. If you're believing God for promotion, you have to believe God to also promote your minister. They forget that. They think. If you don't teach them, that's what you have. So Jesus said, so this is where he was instructing me into the ministry because he said freely you have received freely give but you teach the people their responsibility it is not like pay for service give the services free but teach them their responsibility because if they don't keep their responsibility the angels that back the ministry cause them off on the benefits of the kingdom if they don't keep their responsibility the anointing stops working for them if they don't do, do you see where he said even if it's a cup of water you give to a man, a minister, that man will never lose his reward. So, but now on the part of the priest, this is what he explained. It is one out of the four people you reach. Remember where he healed ten lepers? It was even one out of ten that came back to say thanks. And Jesus was not happy that day. He said, where, where, where they not ten healed, where are the nine? Where are the nine? Why is it that it's only this publican, this one that is a sinner, that came back to give thanks to God? Where are these other ones that are Jews? They are the ones that should know the importance of thanksgiving. When God intervenes in your life, don't just, and you know, and you know, do you know what he told the one that went? He now said, go to the priest. Show yourself to the priest. Offer for a thanksgiving the gifts commanded by Moses. In other words, you don't go to do thanksgiving empty-handed. But do you know there's this thing we read during the feast of Passover, Tabernacles, and all that? God said, Three times in a year, all your men shall come before me, none of them shall come empty handed. Do you know what was the basis for giving that command? Nobody should appear empty handed. That way, you come before God to worship, you don't come empty handed. Do you know what the basis, the argument God gave for establishing that law? He said, Because when I brought you from bondage, when I set you free from Pharaoh. Remember the miracle he did with Passover? He gave them favor with the Egyptians and they left with silver and gold. They spoiled the Egyptians. As long as God is helping me in one way or the other with my career, with my business and I'm earning, I should never, never, ever appear before him empty-handed. If you go for worship and does not give an offering, or some form of appreciation to God, you did not worship. Giving is the seal of worship. Just like if you love a woman, you believe in just rapping with your mouth, I love you, but you don't believe in giving. You can only talk with your mouth, but your hand is like this. You don't love her. There is nothing like love without giving. And there is nothing like worship without giving. Giving is an act of worship. So God said, when people appear before him, nobody should come there empty-handed. So you heard about the three wise men. They found the baby Jesus. A baby. They told Herod, uh, we are looking for this baby, sir. So we might go and worship him. His worship. They knew he was born Messiah. A king was born. They saw the stars in the east. 
and they finally found the baby. And the Bible said when they went there, they did the prostrating, the sign of worship and all that, but they opened up their treasures and then started bringing gifts. Mars, frankincense, what's the uh, gold, mars, and frankincense. That's what you do in worship. And that's also what you do in love. For God so loved the world, he gave. Any love with a radite hand is fake love. And ladies, maybe I need to help you here. Because it's not just God that we are talking about. All these principles apply. You know, one of the things about truth, if you find the check in the nature, you will see the equivalent. Yeah. Like we, if he's sowing and reaping, look into the farm, you will see it. Okay. Some people think giving is um, a law created by pastors so that they can get some money. For example, did you notice at the beginning of the service that I had an instruction in the worship service to tell the people to end this month of August with thanksgiving? But here is the point. <laughs> here is the point. Thanksgiving. Even if God did not give that instruction, because even me, that brought that prophetic word, was not ready. Because if I knew, I would have planned. This is. <laughs> maybe you think Holy Spirit is a joke. Maybe you think it's a joke. Maybe you also think Jesus is just a might, something we created. <laughs> the Bible said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Anybody that will come to God must do two things. You must believe that he exists. Then number two, you must know that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The whole thing about God is to get us blessed, not to take things from you. When they're teaching you giving, it's not to take your money. It's to get you to another level. When you are telling a farmer to go and plant, like this year, because of insecurity, it tampered with agriculture. There are warnings. The government is warning. The Ministry of Agriculture. And there are warnings. The media is warning that we might have food shortages for the next year. It might even affect more than one year. So when you are talking about agriculture and all that, are you trying to steal seed from farmers? Are you trying to steal things from the society? When we are talking about investing your money, go buy stock or start a business. Are we trying to take away your enjoyment? We are trying to move you to a higher level of income. Higher level of productivity. When God is talking to you about anything, he's trying to get something to you. He's not trying to take something from you. You must, number one, believe that he exists. And you must believe that he is a rewarder. He is a rewarder. He is an enabler of them that diligently seek him. That is the attitude with which you come to God. Because he's not a beggar. That is, you need to give something. He's the one that created the universe, the oxygen you are breathing, created the brain with which you are working, created the energy that you are using to work, created every means that you are using here. And that's why this planet Earth is, is a service apartment. Some of you went to primary school, secondary school. When you graduated, did you carry the chair you were sitting on? Because there are other people coming who still need to benefit from that institution. That's how these things are. You don't spoil it. You remember that there are future generations that will benefit. You have been blessed. You have been whatever. For example, <laughs> uh, That's how the earth is. All these things we claim that we own. You met them here. Guess what? You're going to leave all of them here. It's so serious that when you were coming, you came here naked. 
it was deliberate they could have sewn you cloth from the other world so you can come out of the womb with it when you are coming here you didn't bring toothpick when you are coming ordinary pants you did not bring toothbrush the one I will be using in this and I hear of people you know Pastor Nob uh, I don't want to say where but in southern eastern part of Nigeria there are some people who during burial bury people with dollars oh yes one recently buried with a gold coffin and these ones that bury with dollars they said so that he can be spending it in the afterlife no you don't take nothing here the only thing you take is intangible wealth if there are good works you have done things you have done for God for the kingdom of God those works follow you and they will determine your status you can't carry these things you can't take your car while you are here utilize the things that are given to do as much good as possible to serve God as much as possible. To impact lives as much as possible. Because that's what is going to follow you. Do I need to show them that one? I'm sure they believe. But show, show it to them just in case. Yeah, Pastor Ben read. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from hell. Those who die outside Christ are in big problem. They are not blessed at all because they are going to hell. Okay. It's those who die in Christ. Those who have received Christ. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Their works do follow them. All of the good things you have done, all of the things you have done in the service of God, yes, because there now you'll be graded and rewarded and then that, that's all. It's a service apartment. You met, you're going to meet everything here. Some people are going to live in bigger apartments than others. Some will drive bigger cars than others. Some will have more fatter bank account than others. But at the end, the grave levels everybody. That man called Mr. Death is a leveler. Come on, denominator everybody will leave it back here. And I was doing a morning devotion one day and I read Solomon was writing. Please, let's read it for them. For those who say, I'm storing it for my children. Hmm? So, a righteous man lives in inheritance for his children's children. And me too, I'm living in inheritance for my children. But it's limit, limited. I will not leave them something that will destroy their own potential. Make them lazy and useless so that my dad left. No, no, no. I'm going to use a large chunk of my income to do good while I'm alive. Leave them in a minimal so that they don't start empty. So they can build their life. Some of them are going to be greater than me. There are some things you leave them. You destroy them. You destroy their own destiny. They, because they are going to live their life sleeping on their potentials. God gives to the man that is good before him. He gives him joy. gives him peace and all of that. To the sinner he gives travel and toiling. That at the end of the day his job is to gather and he will give it to that one that is good. It's called wealth, wealth transfer. There are seven laws of wealth transfer in the Bible. The person who works for the money might just finish working it and somebody else is the one that will end up with it. Please read it, verse 26. Let them see it. God so given be careful if you are just thinking about gathering and hoarding and you don't want to be a giver. God has some surprises waiting for you. Yes? God give it to a man that is good in his sight. Wisdom, he gives him wisdom, mm -hmm. knowledge, knowledge, and joy. He gives him joy. He also blesses him with peace. Yes, go ahead. But to the sinner, he give it travail to gather and to heap up. He's just walking, 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 making money, making... Who are you gathering all those things? What is the purpose of all the world? 
gathering, gathering, toiling, 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 traveling. Gathering and heaping up. It's only heaping and heaping to do what? Yes? That he may give it to him that is good before God. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. There are about three hidden secrets in this statement. One of them is this subject of wealth transfer. Check all of these powerful wealth when they die. What happens? There are so many of them I have the, there are some I have been called into the family to come and help to. War breaks up. Sometimes it's within the family. Uncles, the children, the wives, even baby mamas will show all kinds of things. At the end of the day, some lawyers end up with large chunk because why they are doing all this? People are eating out who were not part of that. All kinds of groups. Then this one will be settling this senior uncle so that you can come and help life for him in the court. This one will be all kinds of things. And there are some cases where the heirs don't end up with 10% of that wealth something scatters it. Sometimes you are passing, you see abandoned buildings that used to be a mansion or uncompleted, but you can see a massive, you see that pause on the video machine instead of playing, it's now on pause. Somebody died, somebody got sick, somebody, the visionary is gone. See that hotel. The inheritance of the righteous goes to the children's children and children's children. Because the inheritance is not just money. There is a blessing. When you sow, when you are doing good works, when you are advancing the kingdom, what you are investing in will follow your children to, for a thousand generations. There is another principle here. Pastor Leon. God gives to a man that is good in his sight. You see, people, intellectual work. It gives them wisdom, knowledge. Intellectual work is far, far, far more advanced than physical work and toiling up and down. There is spiritual exertion work. There is intellectual exertion work. There is physical exertion. When you go to companies, who are those ones that sit at the executive room up with tea are in a boardroom discussing. They are not the ones driving the trucks, carrying loads, doing all that, but their work is what is moving the organization forward. But they are working with their brain. Smart work is, is far, 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 far more advanced than hard work. It's not that they are not working hard, but instead of sweating, Physically, they are sweating mentally. Developing strategies, coming up with <laughs> new direction for the organization, coming up with marketing strategies and all kinds of things. And finally, you have people at the other end that is a good. Read from this verse. Yes, Pastor Ben. For what has man of all his labor and of the vexation of his heart wherein he has labored under the sun for all his days are sorrows and his travail grief yea his heart take no rest in the night this is also vanity you know some of you don't sleep when you leave office you carry the office to the house you don't get rest, you don't. Verse 24. There's an advice there, and I want them to hear it. Yes? There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. So you see, if a man walks, he should also enjoy the fruit of his labor. The year is ending now. This 2021, running up and down and clean yourself. As this year is ending, fine at least. Go and relax. 
take your wife out. Do something merry. Relax. All these things we are doing, self. You know, for example, in the principles of financial manager, Pastor Ben, we said when you make money, whether it's salary, whatever it is, the first person you respect in your income is God. You remove 10%, it belongs to God. Remove 10 and give it to God. Dedicate it to him. Remove another 10. Pay yourself. The man that labored. Your savings is the only thing that you paid yourself for. Because what happens is that the money comes, we start landlord, uh, school, phone, hospital. You know, you pay every other person. You have not remembered your creator and you have not remembered the man that did the work. When you finish, you have settled everybody. Uncle, mother in the village, you know, my sister who is asking, you finish, you settled everybody, is gone. You wait for the next one. As he comes again, you settle every other person. So here is what he's telling you here. The laborer needs to enjoy his work while he's alive. So there is a 30, 70 principles. It's called the principle of foundation. That's basic stewardship. How to manage your money. Basic. That's not where people like us operate from. But that's where we all started and then you grow in stewardship. Stewardship is a principle that teaches that you don't own that thing, but God made you a manager. He made you a manager of certain resources. The relationships is giving you your life. You are a steward of it. You are not the creator of your life. Your time, your money, and so like your family. So be faithful and manage those things wisely. Now when you come to financial stewardship, there is a 30 70 principle, which is the ABCD of stewardship. This is where you begin. When you get income, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 said, Put the Lord first in your income. Show it to them. And this is the wisest man that ever lived that is writing. And he was a multi billionaire. This is Solomon. These are the things that he learned from David. These are the things that the Jewish people are learning. And they're the ones leading the world in every field. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit. Don't put God second. Don't put him last. Put him first. First fruit of all your increase. Anytime you make any increase, any money, any new earning, put him first. So, ten, God. Ten, pay the elebola and he should be put in a savings account. And he accumulates to a point, you use it to do investment so that you can multiply it. That's one part of your income that is creating a future for you. The last 10 is when you put in another account is for good works, for offerings, for giving, for charity and other. Of course, the subject of sacrifice, take note, is when we go beyond stewardship. Anytime I do sacrificial giving, it means that I'm not operating within the boundaries of stewardship. I'm not going beyond. So I take, that's why it's a painful type of giving. It's not a normal type of giving. It's when I go beyond and then take, deprive myself of more so that I can use that sacrifice. And sacrifice is needed when I want to give away something of value in exchange for something of higher value. And an example is Jesus that gave his life on the cross. He didn't do it for fun. He gave his life because he was given it in exchange for all of us. So sacrifice is the highest level of giving in the kingdom. But I'm not talking about sacrifice. We're talking about stewardship. How a Christian manages his income. He puts God. You pay yourself. And that is called savings. And then out of it, you, you can do investment because what you're doing is you're accumulating capital for strategic investments. If not, what happens is that as such way, you'll be running up and down. So tremendous opportunities can show up and you can do it. 
this is the basics if you like let it be a company or church or whatever this and the church that is operating like this is at the abc level so expenses is limited to 70. that's what it means live below your income not live at the level of your income you can't do that and be wealthy you can't do that and move ahead you can't just spend everything you get and expect to move ahead live below your income if you are expending more than 70 percent of your income you are living a reckless life and it doesn't matter whether you are poor they pay you 10 naira start at that level to practice stewardship good management of resources and god will promote you to higher levels now the man that mentored me the one that father does many years ago in ministry archbishop idahosa now through another challenge because he lived on 10 percent he made a deal with god to reduce his expenses to 10 percent so that he will have 90 percent to do a lot of good works he accomplished what no other preacher in africa accomplished at that time so those of us that were listening we are wondering how is that possible me to just pay tight it will look like i'm going to die if i remove this 10 percent it will look like hey how will i survive this month and in those days oh i didn't used to do savings so i used to spend 90. so just to remove 10 percent it will look like and somebody says he's now living on 10 percent so it was after one time we came there is what they call Idahosa School of Wisdom, where he does teachings. Some of these things are broken down. And then he brought one American who was also teaching and breaking down. I say, yeah, okay, I get it. Have you heard of John Avazini? Yes. He taught the man great. He did a lot of teachings on financial stewardship. I said, no, I now get it. You see, this is the ABCD. There are people who pay 25% tight to God. There are people who give 60% tight. I've met all kinds of people. So what happened is, as you progress in life, if you want to move further, you need to start increasing this 30%. For example, you need to move your savings. Because if you are hoping that one day you will own your own house, you are just a salary person. You don't have a house. You are paying landlord. You are hoping. You need to start increasing that savings. Because one of the investments is in property. Then there are those who want to have higher stake in the kingdom of God. Be able to move the kingdom of God forward. They start increasing that 10%. Now, let me tell you what happened. So, the man now taught us. When you experience a breakthrough in life that there are certain areas of expenses you are freed up from because there are three major big areas that take a large chunk of funds from families one of them is paying rent one of them is school fees education of your children if you have three four and if you have more, ha, the training of those children and the education, unless you live in a place where they give you everything free, free education, is one of the major issues that families have to deal with. Of course, the issue of your landlord is one of the major issues, paying the rent. So he said, if you get to a point where you have been freed, you, maybe you have worked and you've been able to get your own, one of the major deliverance in your life, you have roof over your own house. So people like you now that own your own properties, your giving needs to go higher and your savings needs to go higher. That extra fund available now is not so you can be doing more wastages. It means you should climb higher in the things you do for God and give and impact life. It's, you should also climb higher in your savings ability. That means your capacity for investment needs to move higher so you can create more. People like you should be thinking about how to get up someone and start a company where other people can earn a living 
and they can experience where you were before and gradually they will reach where you are now and to be able to do that capital is accumulated through savings you should have something even if you need other people to now add you want a bank loan you should have something you have accumulated first it's the same thing with church. You should accumulate certain things through savings. Then you can ask for fundraising. A church should not be running on empty whatever. The only way you can run on that is that you just finish undertaking a project which is an investment. A church that is renting an apartment is like that family that is paying rent. Then you believe God finally. You are able to, you are in your own facility. That means you are no more paying rent. Your savings needs to go higher. And your capacity to invest in the kingdom for more outreaches needs to go higher. For good works needs to go higher. That is how it works. Hey. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I think it's from verse 4, Pastor Ben. Let's see. Yes. Hear, hear O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. Yes. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Then he talks about mentoring and training your children. The next verse, yes. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. Yes. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Do you see the word diligent is hard work. If you are in my shoe, the, the level of responsibility on my head, my office deals with five different, the international thing is there. The African initiative is there. Just that one is enough. The national initiative is there. The regional initiatives is there. One person has to share himself. And then at the end of it, I, I still have to have time to look after you guys here. And then that is not all my responsibilities because I have responsibility as a husband and I have responsibility as a father. How do you do all that? And I have personal responsibility because I have to have devotion. I have to have time to study. If not, forget it, it is over. Some people make the service of God look like it's punishment. We are suffering for the Lord. Yes, we are suffering for him. But you should balance it. This Christmas, go and take your wife out. You don't have to start with some very powerful. Remember, stewardship is what graduates you up if you are doing it. Anybody that is operating stewardship, it will be enjoying constant promotion. But an aircraft does not take off and be at the top. It, you climb. This is how it will be going. If you practice the worship, you will find that there is no new year that will come that will leave you at the same. He that is faithful in little, God gives him much. He is faithful in much, he gives him much more. He is faithful in much more, he gives him much, much more. That's how he operates. Teach them diligently. That's Deuteronomy 6, 7. Teach them. Go ahead, sir. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in the house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So when it comes to mentoring kids, it's not just morning devotion. He said, when you rise up in the morning, when you lie down. The reason is that there might be devotion in the morning, but opportunities will come out in the course of the day. It might be some things that will come up. Utilize it to push in some certain important lesson. Like they start quarreling over food. That might be the opportunity to push in what you studied with them on love, on generosity, on conflict resolution, on forgiveness. Teach it diligently to your children. Add one more verse and I will leave it. Verse That's, 8. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy, ha thy hand, and they shall be as frontless between thy eyes. Okay, if, if we want to take it further, 
because he's recorded twice, you will see he even said to also put them on the doorposts of your house. If you're looking for things to paste, let it be scripture. Find some powerful, godly, wise principles. It might not be quoted verbatim from the Bible. It might be a, a wisdom quote that is scripture based. You paste it. You can even frame it. If you've been to my house then in Lagos, you will see different. We took time to go and frame them. If you are coming here at the entrance, you see one frame. I and the children, the Lord God has given me, we are for signs and wonders. You come to another place. You see the one with ego. And then it's written there, let them have dominion. You come to another place, you see another one. That's what we, but God encourages, even if his bangles you wear, even if he's, you want to, you know, do it with scripture. I don't encourage tattoo at all. The Christian should not dabble into that. But if you have to tattoo, tattoo the scripture. I'm sure God will not be angry with that one. Do you see it? Thou shalt write it upon the posts of your house and on your gates. Go back to verse 8 so that you see. You shall bind them for a sign on your hand. I don't support tattoo. Don't go and say, I, the peace say, okay, now we can tattoo John 3 16. But if you have to do it, Pastor Ben, there is actually a right way to do tattoo. What the scripture is actually condemning has to do with this thing that they do that touches the human blood. Evil spirits get into people through that. Yes. Africans have been doing tattoo. You go and watch some of your African movies. You see what they draw. Those ones are skin surface so that you can remove it tomorrow. Not these ones where they embed things under the skin and get blood. And when they're doing it, you'll be crying because it's painful. If you have done such a thing, God will forgive you. But don't go and do it if you have knowledge. If you want, I'll show you the scripture. The Bible outlaws it. During the Protestant Reformation, they taught them in Europe, starting with Germany. They said it was the laziest country in Europe. People are poor and all that. The Protestant ethics, four principles. Work as hard as you can. Earn as much as you can. Make as much, every opportunity to make. Make. Save as much as you can. Then give. Give as much as you can. So, when they tell them to exert, to earn more, it's because they have to give more and they also have to save more. So, here are the principles. When they say save as much as you can, the principle is accumulate capital so you can also start creating jobs, creating opportunities where other people can work. After a while, you are doing real estate. After a while, you are starting a company. After a while, you are not just accumulating capital for nothing. And because they taught these four principles of the Protestant ethics, Germany turned to become the most disciplined, the hardest working nation in Europe. Britain, Switzerland, and all of a sudden, all of those Protestant nations became the superpower nations. You know that Germany was so powerful that it threatened the rest of the world wanted to conquer the whole world. And it took com effort of combined nations to subdue them and defeat them at the Second World War. And today, all Protestant nations were built on Protestant ethics are all superpowers. From Switzerland to Australia to Canada to United Kingdom to America to Sweden, all of them. If you hear of any country that is broke, that is having financial problem in Europe. It's a Catholic nation. So a Catholic bishop wrote a book about the secret of the industrialized nation. 
And he went to explore this Protestant ethics and said this is what made the difference. Because remember the Protestants came out of the Catholic Church. But there is an area they understood the Bible better and then he now started challenging the Catholic nations to adopt that. People left poverty and came out of and they teach them stewardship. They teach more of stewardship than prosperity. And stewardship creates prosperity. Here in Nigeria, we teach prosperity and not teach stewardship. And you give people the ripe fruit. That's what you tell them. You don't tell them how to grow the fruit. How to plant and grow it to that. They taught the believers stewardship. They, it's not just that you work hard and earn money. There's also principles, biblical principles for how you manage your resources. And then stewardship must go beyond money to how you manage your family, how you manage your health, how you manage your time. How you manage your life, ultimately. So you see, it goes beyond money to other resources. One more revisit. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Go back to that verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters. You shall find it after many days. I want to revisit verse 2. Yes, give a portion. Go ahead. Give a portion to seven and also to eight. For thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. Make sure that you have multiple givings. That you, you, you... You know, part of what makes a man is the quality of people you surround yourself, you move around with. In the, in the class, I, uh, my, you see, every, this one is paying 25%, he's giving away 25% of his income. This one is doing 40, this one is doing this. Everybody is at different levels of. So now, when you have such more money conserved, what do you do? You channel them. Not you go and expand your expenses. You have some more. You channel more to savings, channel more to giving. So you see now, when you have savings capacity, when it's time, maybe there is a project in the kingdom, they are buying this company, or they are, we are doing this, or you want to do into some very strategic whatever, you have capital. And you don't just put savings in savings account. It gets to a point, you tie it into an investment. <laughs> And because I have a lot of sons in the ministry who watch us. And it's not just personal funds that you do that. Part of good stewardship of the church. When a church has accumulated through the saving culture, certain level of capital. Don't just leave it to be lying and they are collecting interest on your money. It's invest it in. So even if it's fixed deposit. Negotiate for good return. So next time you need that money, maybe you are buying land or buying, it has climbed. That is what Jesus said when he said he gave talents to different people and he asked one, he gave one talent. Why did you bury my money? Why didn't you put it in the bank so I will receive it with usury? Usury is interest. Jesus was teaching good stewardship and good financial management. So he dealt, punished that unfaithful servant for mismanaging his resources. Today, it was more about financial stewardship. Tomorrow, it could be relationship stewardship. Another day, it could be time management or time stewardship. Because stewardship is management. Tomorrow, it could be health stewardship or health management. I hope you got something this morning. Eh? Then give the Lord praise for that.